Welcome, everybody, to the Old Gold Show. With you, as always, I'm co-manager over at Hammer and Rails, Andrew Ledman. And I'm Casey. The loneliest number is one, Bartley, at Boiler Upload Rivals Network. See, that that would normally work, but right now there are four number ones, so it's just as lonely as every other number. I don't like this. I Because I just blew your mind? You did. Okay, good. Well, we can move right past it. So, Wouldn't they still be the loneliest, even if they were tied, though? Because they're still the loneliest. It's just four of them are the loneliest. Well, everyone would be the loneliest. I suppose you could make an argument. Sure. Yeah. All Lonely right, we'll go with that. Yeah. There's not a more lonely number one than Purdue. No, sure. None of the other ones are uh, are, are coming off a, uh, a number 16 loss. No one else has to prove themselves. Well, yeah. With a win. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about the Big Ten Tournament. Uh, we know that's in the rearview mirror now, though, so we're not going to spend a ton of time on it. Then we're going to look ahead just at mostly the Midwest bracket, but, you know, the bracket in its entirety that was announced on Selection Sunday that was yesterday. And then we're going to look at Purdue's specific matchup, which, <laughs> hey, because of playing games, we don't even know who it's going to be yet. So uh, That's never Casey backfired has, before. Yeah. Casey has been watching film, he's been watching some tape, and he's going to have some information for us on Montana State and Grambling State. So we'll have that in the second half of the pod. But first, Casey, you were in attendance at the Big Ten Tournament. You saw Purdue fall 76-75, to I believe was the final score. Purdue loses by one in overtime to Wisconsin. It was a tough game. Uh, Zach Eady headed to the bench really early with uh, one foul and then a technical that kind of doubled up on him there. And Would you rather do that motion in real life or the charge, the block? What one, what one do you think is the most satisfying to like do most, as an official? I think, I, think, I think most satisfying is the charge because you kind of get a like, you get a step into it, you know, you kind of step forward and give it one of those. Yeah, but you get the hips involved with the charge call, or with the uh, block call. Oh, yeah, because you yeah. got to do the hip thrust. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's not bad Ladies, either. You see that? You see that action? Nope. The taken man. Nope. Well, yeah, and, and now he's clean shaven because mm. we lost. So I went ahead and shaved. So yep. uh, clean shaven as of this morning. And Casey. And I have uh, these on because I have laser beam eyes. Yes, that's right. Uh, in the middle of shaving this morning, my razor died. Oh, no. So I was, I was left with a mustache and half of a mm. goatee. And mm. I had to have that for about half an hour while my razor charged. You had the three quarter circle, huh? It was well, crescent it was moon. Nice. Yeah, yeah, mm. crescent moon. That's what I'm going to call it. And I should have left it, just trimmed it up a little bit. It would have been great. Um, do you take so pictures throughout to... the process? I do sometimes. I did yeah, not this do. time until it <clears throat> died. And so I <clears throat> have the because I sent it to my wife a picture of just like you know my face looking ridiculous and said my razor died. So uh, so now we're starting a playoff beard, an NCAA tournament beard. We'll see how far we get. Um, I will not be shaving until at least, you know, Purdue loses. So let's let's hope I look like uh, my normal self in about, a, you know, three weeks' time, four weeks' time. But Purdue lost in Madison, or not in Madison, in Minneapolis mm -hmm. against the Badgers. Given the strange nature of the game, the fact that Edie went out with a two, um, Braden Smith ultimately fouled out, and he was, of course, coming back from the calf. Do you think that there is a whole lot to take from this game, or is this just a Big Ten tournament game where you're playing the same team for the third time, and it's kind of throw out the window? I mean, are we having this question if... I... There's a couple ways to talk about it, because, like, point blank, if Edie played for seven more minutes in the first yeah. half, are, is Purdue one point better in that game? Absolutely. So therefore they win. Right. And this is not a talking point. Right. Then we would have been, Purdue would have played Illinois and who knows what would happen in that one, obviously, but we at, would have gotten to the championship game. At the same time, Edie played in the second half and Purdue had nine second half turnovers. It was not great for sure. A lot. Yeah. Um, Look, it, it's hard to say that this team didn't care about that game or winning the tournament when it would have been so easy. We talked privately. We obviously didn't have a show because 
works hard. It's yeah. A lot of time. A lot going on. Time. Yeah. Um, obviously, if they didn't actually care or want to win the tournament, you rest Braden Smith, who's suffering from right. a calf strain, calf strain injury. Which, by the way, guys, we can say that we are concerned with a calf strain, with with a muscle being pulled and playing within 24 hours, without A, inserting that we are a doctor, B, saying <laughs> that we know better than you know, athletic training staffs, Matt Painter, coaching staff. Our implications are not to say that we are far superior in medical knowledge. Right. Yeah. But we are all humans and we have muscles and we have dealt with pulled yeah. things. And yeah. they generally don't just get better when you go and play a division one college basketball game the very next day. Yeah. Yeah. It is and, not and, you know, it is not a mind blowing thing to be concerned about that fact. Yeah, and and the calf is just a terrible injury to have. I believe last year it was largely what kind of slowed down Fletcher Lawyer, and it lingered on him throughout most of the season. So we saw kind of his production go down last yeah. year. But did you notice anything in this game with Smith? Because, I mean, he came out right away, hit a great three, hit another mid-range. Um, but I believe those are the only two shots he made. Um, I think he hit two more free throws maybe or, or got two other points somehow. Um but he didn't look hobbled. He didn't look slow, really, I think, too terribly noticeably. I thought he, well, so we kind of talked about the last few games how Braden Smith had really ranched, like, ratcheted up his defense. Yeah. And it was really good against Illinois and then was the same Wisconsin team. It was not good against Wisconsin. He did not look like someone that was out in front of steps, super quick. I mean, Hepburn had a day with him, but like 23 yeah. points on his head. Hepburn was outrageous. Uh, Probably the best game of Hepburn's year. Yeah, including a, a game-tying free like layup that Smith just gave up. Yeah. I And like Smith was not getting... Smith's game's weird, right? Because like he's fast and quick, but he doesn't do a ton at the rim. That's usually not what it is. Usually right. when he gets to the rim, it's because the entire defense is just like stuck to Zach Eady. Mm -hmm. So we're not really used to the blow buys, but no, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say he was a hundred percent. I wouldn't say he was 85%. I thought he played physically smart. I don't think he pushed it too much. Um, I hope not. I hope not. And like, he didn't get the ball in the last second. It went to Lance Jones instead. Um, if that's a healthy Smith, that's a Smith trying to run up the court. You got to think with the ball. But I don't yeah, think he was maybe. looking to, you know, lead full sprints on the court. I, I, I think in the back of his mind, he's like, I can't hurt this worse. And I yeah. think that limits you. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's a part of you, if you have an injury, knowing that ultimately that game didn't matter. I mean, it well, would have been great to get... Get not even that, just like if you have a hurt muscle, you're not gonna like you are conscious of it. You're not going well, yeah, to yeah, pull out. Yeah. But I mean his thought process, I'm sure, is I want to play every game. He always wants to be out there. Painter's always said, you know, he basically has to pull Braden Smith off the floor because Braden Smith would play 40 mm -hmm. minutes every game if he had his choice. But Braden Smith also is a smart man who knows that the semifinals of the Big Ten tournament are not as important as round one round two of the ncaa tournament which unless is you win the big 10 tournament, then they're the most important things <laughs> yeah exactly keep that in mind because that's i'm sure what we all said last year when Purdue mm -hmm. won the big 10 tournament so, most important thing uh I, I mean i just think it's not the end of the world that Purdue lost that game um i obviously i want them to win every game i was rooting for them to win but you get the extra day's rest you hopefully deal with a Braden Smith calf injury and a Zach Eady foot slash ankle injury. Um, get those guys healthy an extra day of rest. Not the worst thing in the world. So uh, I don't know if I'm rationalizing here or if I truly believe, but I I'm not overly concerned with anything that I saw happen in that Big Ten um, tournament game. Lance Jones was not good for he two straight days. Um he has been I, – I, there was at one point in the season where, like, you can't even call him inconsistent anymore because he ran off a stretch of, like, 10 straight games where he was almost good for 20 points a night and really good. The last 
handful of games or so, the offense has kind of abandoned him. It it seems a little bit like he doesn't know where his shots are coming from naturally, and then he tries to force the issue. Yeah, he's he's taken a lot of bad threes over the last two weeks, three weeks. That's concerning. At the same time, I thought both the freshmen had maybe two of their best showings of the season, including yeah. some big Miles Cam cameos on on back to back games. Colvin is getting in there and making an impact. Um, you know, you kind of see both his size and willingness to shoot very encouraging that cut to get the dunk. And then yeah. I thought Camden Heidi was super aggressive on the glass. His de- defense continues to be good. I thought if painter screwed anything up, it was having Smith out there on that final play of regulation guarding Hepburn. He had four fouls and he's a little injured. Bring Heidi in. Yeah. Put Heidi on Hepburn. That's fair. I, I talked about this uh, with Ryan earlier uh, yesterday what did you think of the choice to take Edie away from the basket on that final play and have him guard the inbound? It makes so much sense because you can't have him just hanging at the rim because a three-pointer loses it for you. I mean, sure, but... So the worst thing that can happen is Edie comes to help, the ball gets kicked out, and yeah, but with, Purdue with loses two, it. With two and a half, I mean, I, but... It, what happened is with there's benefit- two and a half seconds left. There's two and a half seconds left. Wisconsin had not been shooting the three very well. I understand putting Edie on it. He's obviously seven foot four, long limbs, tall, but he's also your best rim protector, your best defender. Look, so if they're if they're going to tie the game, you know they're going to the hoop, and it would help to have the seven foot four guy around the rim. How about Braden just doesn't let a guy have an open? Lane I mean, to sure, the- but yeah. that's that's the conversation. The strategy worked. The point they got the ball into the corner, and Smith just let him cross up and get to the rim untouched. This isn't a painter thing. It's not a coach thing. It's a Braden Smith got beat when the one thing you don't want to give up is a wide open layup or a wide open three. And Smith gave up a layup. He just gave it up. Like that, it was. It it's, was. Very it's not a problem defense. on painter. Like there's nothing you can do. Lance Jones talked about it after the game, where like, and he probably should have helped a little, but like you can't leave a shooter there because you lose the game. Like one of the benefits of being the number one team and believing you're the best team is if we go to overtime, it's fine, but I'm not going to lose it on this possession. Yeah. Um, obviously it didn't work out that way, but Braden Smith just, you can't just give up a layup. If anything, yeah, Smith and- being out there with four fouls, not being willing to like, cause you foul that layup. The, the emergent thing, emergency thing is you foul Hepburn there. So he has to make free throws, but Smith has four fouls. He can't do that. Yeah. And Purdue had a real problem at the end of both regulation and overtime of just giving up easy buckets to this Wisconsin team. So I guess in that sense, that was a little concerning. But I do think the fact that Braden Smith had four fouls was part of it. I think he believed he needed to stay in that game. And that if Hepburn makes the makes the layup, he's like, like you said, okay, we're going to go into overtime. I need to be on here, uh, be able to play the next five minutes. So maybe there's something to that, but, uh, you know. I'm not taking anything too much uh, to heart on that. So is there anything else about the Big Ten tournament you want to talk about or get off your chest before we look at the bracket? No. um, I kind of brought it up with Painter last night. Purdue guys, ED, like, technicals are flying. Mm -hmm. And that's part of, like, being a team that runs a conference. Like, people are going to come at you. They're going to try to get to you. Any technical foul, any double tech where Edie picks up a technical and anyone else picks up a technical on the other team was worth it for them. Is a win for the other team. So guess yep. what? They're seeing that Edie's been drawn up for techs like three times this year now, I think, something like that, two or three times. Teams are going to see that. They're going to step to him. They're yep. going to try to get that to happen. It's not going to go away in the tournament. So, like, kind of just like Painter said, just shut up and play. Like, yeah. Uh, you kind of just have to own it and like be the bigger team. If you're about the things that you're about, which is literally just winning and doing like do it the right way and don't care about what anyone else says, that means you don't have to yap back. And that goes for yeah. lawyer. That goes for Lance Jones. Um, yeah. Like it, the, the you just only can't other... like Edie put himself out of the game. Yeah. For 10 minutes. Yeah. And you like, you're going to do that in the first round of a tournament. Let's hope not. Let's hope yeah. not. The only other thing that is now coming to me that I wanted to mention is 
it was very frustrating to see Braden Smith get that fifth foul because it was a pure frustration foul. Hepburn was all up on him the whole time, going after him, kind of getting into his jersey, putting his hands on him, putting his hands on him, and Braden Smith just kind of like got frustrated and extended the arm on him and got called for the foul. Fifth foul, turned the ball over. I mean, that's it. That was almost the ball game in overtime there. Uh, pretty frustrating to see, and I hope he learns from that and kind of doesn't allow his defender to get in his head like that again. Yeah, that's one where it's frustrating and bad on Purdue. Um, the ball that gave Wisconsin the ball back uh, when Edie got hammered and threw it out of bounds. Yeah. That's just frustrating because, like, you can't have three guys jump into Edie mm-hmm. and not call anything. Like, the yeah. cylinder yeah. exists. It either exists or it doesn't. And it's, it's right. clear it doesn't if you're seven foot four. That's right. Yep. But yeah, uh, that's I, in that's in an asterisk in the rules. Yeah, I did. and I mean that's another one of those annoying ones where you're like, oh, you're going to talk about a play call, but like if that's not a turnover, Purdue wins the game. Yeah, yeah, because it's yeah, free I mean, throws. Either, well, it's either free throws or Edie gets the pass off to Braden Smith, who was streaking down for a wide open yep. layup. I mean, it, it the only way that didn't happen is is that they fouled him and they got away with it. So. Um, as the announcer said on TV, it was a savvy move. You know, they said that a couple times when somebody did, did something clearly yeah. against the rules but didn't get caught. It's savvy. savvy. Um, yeah. So last night was Selection Sunday. Purdue finds themselves as the number one seed in the Midwest. Casey, would you prefer to focus on just the Midwest or do you want to look at all of the brackets, all the regions? I, probably the Midwest. I, I think the only real talking point is that, like, Purdue got the – third number one seed yeah which you can argue doesn't super matter um no i mean they got they got the locations they wanted they're gonna assuming you know they go to the second weekend it'll be indianapolis then detroit and then you know phoenix is for the same for everybody so they got the midwest locations they're the number one seed third overall which did surprise me especially be because Either everyone leading up into Selection Sunday was wrong, saying that Purdue had the best resume, or a one-point loss in a semifinal of your conference tournament really knocked them from first to third, even though Houston got absolutely demolished in their conference tournament. It didn't make much sense to me. It's just weird where, like, I think it's less frustrating for Purdue and more frustrating for, like, Michigan State gets in, and they get in because of not how they did against good teams, just that they were willing to schedule it Mm -hmm. because they had 13 games against Tier 1. But they were 3 of 10 in those games. (laughs) Like, they didn't earn anything past scheduling. They didn't didn't win their way into the tournament. They scheduled their way into the tournament. And that's got to be frustrating. You know, Indiana State's the obvious one where everyone's like, they should be in. Um, Yeah. But, like, there's a lot of teams where, like, could you tell me, like, why Michigan State is a lock and Ohio State wasn't even in the conversation? I can. Tom Izzo. Yeah, but Diebler, new head coach. The next Tom Izzo. Yeah, but no one no one knew his name two months ago. <laughs> but, yeah, it's um, – it continues to be weird, but also, like – it's more frustrating when it's a small school that gets left out. Cause like yeah. they're literally like going above expectation to even be considered and Michigan state couldn't have tripped their way anymore to still right. getting rewarded. So right. just like, yeah. what, what is the heart of the tournament and everything you say you value, but then like it, it shouldn't be enough just to play hard teams. Yeah. And in Indiana state did basically everything the committee has said to do, you know, play a difficult out of conference, uh, play games on the road, play games in neutral sites versus rather than home sites where, you know, you you get less value for those. They absolutely dominated in their conference, just didn't win their conference tournament. And suddenly I think their net was what, like 29 Mm -hmm. and and either the net matters or it doesn't. And I I, I just just don't know. And you got to figure out a way for Michigan state as you said, they they scheduled their way to a good net rating, and then it didn't really matter if they won or lost the games. And like, they lost most of them. And it's annoying because like Michigan State is talented enough to be a tournament team. 
they yeah, might absolutely. win a game. They might win two games. Like, yeah. But like the product they put out there, their resume does not like it didn't earn them what, like you said, like Izzo Spartans, like that's what got them there. And it's, it's just weird that we pretend that there are all these metrics and advanced things and other things that the committee is paying attention to when really it's, it's still a lot of the same stuff. It's just, we want, we want better. We want good matchups. We want good matchups. We want good stories. We want big names that people recognize. And if you don't have those things, you better win your conference tournament or you better, you know, have risen in the rankings throughout the year. So that we got a little bit of a story to grab onto. Which is why Purdue's in prime time. That's yeah. Well, that's one reason for sure. Uh, I do believe I, I, losing, called that. I called that way early. I, I mean, I believe you. it makes sense because Purdue obviously lost last year to a 16 no. and now the pressure. Didn't happen. Well, you, you, I mean, okay. You can't yeah. tell me that's not at least part of the decision to put them in prime time, though, right? It's the whole decision. It's gonna. Yeah. It's on Friday. We're gonna get two days worth of. Can Purdue pull it off? Will they be that's like gonna... Virginia, or will they crumble uh, once again? I, you know, the Virginia comparisons just keep getting more and more because someone pointed out Virginia lost in their semifinal of their conference championship Ooh. the year they came back and won. Virginia they also made the it. tournament this year. Yes, they did. Barely. Uh, How they get they in also, Indiana State? That's another that? good question. Um, and, you know, Virginia also, I guess, went into that tournament when they won the whole thing with 29 wins. Purdue has 29 wins. It's like, okay, now, like... If if it does if it doesn't work and we can't point to it anymore, it's just going to be even more frustrating. But uh, you look at the Midwest region, a lot of familiar names for Purdue fans if they paid attention this year. Uh, we got Gonzaga as the five, Kansas as the four, who we could have played in Maui, but they didn't hold up their end of the deal. Samford, who Purdue played earlier in the year and beat by roughly fifty. Uh, we've got Texas, who's Purdue, who Purdue has played in the. Um, NCAA tournament tournament a couple times in recent years. We got Virginia, of course, who broke Purdue's heart uh, years ago. Then we've got Tennessee, who Purdue beat in Maui, and St. Peter's, who obviously we know all about uh, losing to St. Peter's in the NCAA tournament. <laughs> so I mean, just the the number of teams that Purdue recognizes in this bracket was crazy to me. Yeah, it's um, I guess I should have seen the Kansas thing coming. It, what do you mean? It, it just, it's the exact right four for them, story-wise. Because, like, l- watch Kansas get healthy. And, like, their four uh, best players, not. their starting lineup, like, their four is, like, legitimately as good as any team in the country. Oh, yeah. But they're, um, just, they're not healthy right now. Right. But we'll see, if they, we'll see if it stays that way. Yeah. While also having a guy who's familiar with Edie. Um, yeah. You know, we've talked about this multiple times all season. I think Hunter Dickinson hurts their chances against Purdue because I think your advantage against Purdue is not playing a normal, you know, five on five basketball game, not trying to match up. You want to make it crazy. You want to make it chaotic. You want to move Purdue as much as possible. And I think Hunter Dickinson, like we've seen it in the big 10, um, the things he wants to do, he's going to struggle with more than Edie is uh, because he's, he's not stopping Edie. And at the other end, he's right. probably not getting the best of him down low. We'll get a I w- I wouldn't some think buckets so. here and there, but so. like, but yeah, it's just super talented team. I think Creighton's got to feel good about where they're at. Um, obviously, Purdue and Tennessee. Yeah, Purdue and Tennessee played earlier this season, but like, are we even going to consider a, that a basketball game? I mean, it was a hell of a game. Uh, roughly a hundred free throws and two hundred fouls were called in that game. Um, but as, as someone pointed out on Twitter and I can't give them credit because I don't remember who it was, if Purdue uh, goes through, they could literally play the same teams that they played in Maui in the same order that they played them. That's great. In, in this Good job, Maui. We could play Gonzaga, and then we would play um, Tennessee, and then we would play Marquette. So uh, It's, yeah, just wild. So uh, I'm sure the people who organized the Maui Invitational are like, we told you. We're good at this. This is our bracket. Yeah. So, I mean, Purdue, obviously, we don't know who they're going to play yet. We're going to save that for the second half. 
um, here after the break. But looking at Purdue's bracket, how do you think things shook out for them? Who are you, you know, maybe scared of seeing? Are you happy with where they are? What do you know about that 8-9 matchup? Anybody who stands out in this Midwest bracket region? I'm not super knowledgeable on the 8-9 yet. I have not looked into it. But I do know McNeese State scares me a little bit. South Carolina scares me a little bit. They really depend. They get up for big games, physical team. Um, Creighton is... I get the feeling Creighton's going to be there and not Tennessee. You think so? I do. Um, it's another that would one be the, where... That would be the Elite Eight matchup if those two teams were to meet, Purdue and ten, um, Creighton. I mean, Tennessee showed even when Dalton Connect goes for 40, that offense around him is just really not stable, um, not dangerous. Uh, that That Purdue game, like, the lack of fireworks just from everyone around them. I, I still don't trust them to score a bunch. <coughs> but I, I do feel like if you would have made, like if we would have went together and like made a list of teams that scare me about Purdue, I think they avoided like the heavy hitters of those. And who do you think those would be? I mean, just for those listening. Kentucky, obviously for, you know, boring athletical talk reasons okay um just trying to scroll through here to see who the other ones i would i iowa state a little bit just because they defend really really hard yeah they were gonna be one that i was gonna say um arizona obviously doesn't uh baylor didn't really auburn didn't there weren't a ton of teams uh, which i I feel like I need to talk, like I need to remember how confident I was last year <laughs> and how little Fairly Dickinson looked like not a threat on paper. Yeah. Yeah. They had I like remember. the worst defense in the country last year and they held pretty remember, under 60. I remember watching the first four game with Fairly Dickinson and I don't even remember who else they played. Uh, I don't remember who they even Texas faced. Texas Southern. Okay, sure. I believe. Uh, you could be absolutely wrong. I have no, I have my mental uh, ability to check on that is absolutely gone. So I remember watching that game and thinking both of these teams are so bad. I was like, Purdue is not going to have a problem with this. In fact, we, me and two other writers from hammer and rails did a Twitter live Twitter spaces, whatever they were called back then, back when it was still Twitter. we just talking about the teams afterward and saying, you know, this is what we saw. We don't think it should be a problem. You know, Purdue obviously has more talent, has more athleticism, should be able to out-rebound these guys by a ton. Um, So, you know, it's a one versus 16. It's only happened once. Purdue's a better team. We should be fine. And that was was our attitude going into that game. And then obviously we saw what happened. Yeah. um, Like you said, well, we're going to talk about the specific teams that Purdue's going to face in the second half here. But... There are demons. There are... I, I think that's the one thing you get worried about about the uh, Wisconsin game is the issues that showed up. Inability turnovers. to get good looks, turnovers. It's just dumb plays. Um, yeah. The one argument for is Fletcher Lawyer and Mason Gillis did step up and make shots late. Um, right. I, I don't think there's any... There's no way... Like This team shoots much better than it did last year. It, it just does, yeah. top to bottom. Um. And that's literally all they needed was like one or two shots. But there are concerns deeper in when like things do get tough. Does Purdue tighten up? Do yeah? Do they get into their stuff? Do they do they get thrown off by officiating or a call or physicality or whatever it is? And the only reason we have to ask that is like we just haven't seen it on this stage. And there's no. Yeah, I mean, because it you can point to what they did in Maui, you can point to the fact that they had an undefeated non-conference against, you know, teams like Alabama, teams like Arizona and everybody that they took down in Maui. But those games, as big as they are, it's not March. It's not win or go home. It's not for Zach Eady win and never put on a Purdue uniform again. Same thing for, you know, Lance Jones and Mason Gillis and Ethan Morton. It's not the same when you're playing those teams in December. 
And we we just don't know how this team's going to react uh, in March now that it is that time that they've faltered so often in. Yeah, because it's hard because we've seen every level of success that a team can have away from March. Seen Purdue not lose a non-conference game in three years. Tournament styles, everything else. They run through them. They've ran through the Big Ten and won it by three games the last two seasons. Last year, Purdue also went and won the Big Ten tournament. It hasn't translated to March. Nope. Whatever is happening, logical, emotional, physical, it's not translating. And until Purdue does that, we can't just point and say, yeah, there it is. See, we told you all along. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's so hard because we've we've been in this situation for just over a year. You know, the Fairleigh Dickinson game was a year ago on Sunday. So it was one year was Selection Sunday from when Purdue lost to Fairleigh Dickinson. And Purdue has not had a chance to prove themselves since then it's just it's different in march we all know that we all understand that and they will have their first chance on friday at 7 25 and unless you have anything else about the midwest we'll take a break and talk about who they might be facing friday 7 25 the best month of the year is here which is why you need to know that we are now partnered with BetMGM. We'll be using BetMGM lines to make all of our picks, and we'll have special offers for the listeners and the viewers of the Field of 68 all through the NCAA tournament. If you haven't signed up for BetMGM yet, you can use the bonus code FIELD, and you will get up to a $1,500 first bet offer on your first wager with BetMGM, regardless of whether or not that bet is. Hits. Here's the best part. All you need to do is deposit and bet $10 of your hard-earned money. This is how you make it work. Download the BetMGM app and sign up using the bonus code FIELD. Deposit at least $10 and place your first wager on any game. And you get up to $1,500 in bonus bets regardless of the outcome of your bet. Just make sure you use that bonus code FIELD when you sign up. Most importantly, we do have some fun stuff coming for the conference tournaments and especially for the NCAA tournament. Bet insurance tokens college hoops odds boost and what i love the most a nice parlay boost for anything you could possibly imagine betting on in the ncaa tournament from odds and getting an at large bid to final four futures to the highest seed to make to the sweet 16 i'm calling it right now bet mgm is the king of the prop bet for your march madness needs so go download the bet mgm app use the code field and sign up today and while i've got you a quick request the best way to support the field of 68 and our content you get for free is to engage with us rate and review the pod like and share the youtube videos tell your friends about us it helps in a world where the algorithm is king and now back to the show and we are back so as we talked about in the first half, Purdue has only a faint idea of who they're going to be playing uh, in their game on Friday, down to two. So we've got the Montana State Bobcats uh, from the Big Sky Conference, and then we've got the Grambling State Tigers from the SWAC. Uh, Casey, what I understand, and I said it earlier, you were watching some tape, you were watching some film of these two teams and you sent me some rather menacing messages that I don't want to reference because they scared me a little bit. So what can you tell me about either of these teams, kind of style of play, who they are? I mean, anything. Let's be honest. No one know, knew anything about Montana State until probably late last night or today. Well, let's do it the way that uh, I presented it to you. Do you want the good news or the bad news? In this instance, give me the bad news first. Okay. Well, Bad we'll, news. We'll, We'll wash the medicine down with a little sweetness. Bad news, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Grambling State's steal percentage is the exact same as Fairleigh Dickinson last year. Uh, <laughs> if you are talking about out of these two teams, which is more similar to that style, it is definitely Grambling State. Um, the one argument to be made is Grambling is not very good on offense. Um more which is weird right because we think of fairly dickinson as a small defensive minded team they were not um not a good defensive team last year metrically at all they forced a lot of tournaments but they were tiny they were super aggressive and they had like the 359th best defense in the country yeah i remember that, that. once again they held number one seed purdue to less than 60 points unbelievable 
So, like, it's kind of a mockery to what we're doing here, what anyone's doing right. talking about these yeah. games. Nothing makes sense. Gremlin yeah. State is more athletic, smaller. Um, their offense struggles. Um, they they are, and I'm looking at Ken Palm, they are 297th on offense. Yeah, they they don't... Like, Dazier is a pretty decent guard. Their lead guard, he gets to the hoop. He's left-handed. He's strong, but he's short. He's shooting 33% from three. Um, they've got, like... One guy who is like a wing kind of stretch who got hot in the conference tournament, and that's a big reason why they're here. Uh, right. But they don't shoot the ball particularly well. Um, they're not. They're not as like super tiny as Fairleigh Dickinson. They're not as quick. Um, but like, they I mean, have, that's good. They have some bodies. Like, it, it's. I wouldn't describe them as a super chaos team. Like they weren't playing super fast, um, a little more kinetic than like straight harassing you on defense. Yeah. So w- what worries me about that conversation is, you know, as we said, we went into this game last year with, against Fairly Dickinson, fairly confident mm-hmm. in Purdue's ability to win because Fairly Dickinson had no one who could slow down Edie. And we believed that there was enough other pieces around Zach Eady shooting wise that would, you know, continue to carry the load should they, you know, triple team Zach Eady. This season, I think we basically feel the same because Zach Eady has gotten better, but those shooters around him have gotten so much better. Uh, they're more consistent, they're shooting at a higher percentage. And so, is the belief right now, I think, for Purdue fans that this team now is what we thought last year's team was? A little bit, for sure. Um, I think we did a lot of... They look like good shooters, so we're going to ignore that the fact that they're like 32% from three. Yeah. Um, it's hard to say, like... It'd be one thing if, like, we're talking about Purdue losing in the round of 32 to, like, Memphis or Florida Atlantic, like, teams that went all the way that showed themselves to be, like, actual challengers in this tournament. Right. So it's it's hard to really say it's anything besides just, like, Purdue being young and not being up to it and, like, just collapsing. Like, yeah, it it's true. Like, Purdue's been very clear, like, Fairly Dickinson went out and played better than Purdue. Oh, it absolutely. Wasn't a, it wasn't a, a lucky win, and that's terrifying to me. <laughs> right? Yeah that that makes it worse. It it does make it worse. So it it's like they've done everything they can this season to prove themselves better. They're not turning the ball over as much. They won way more games. They knocked down shots. Um, you can just look and be like, Braden Smith is a much better point guard. And I think if the injury didn't happen, I think that would have been more than enough to be like, look, Braden Smith this season is not letting an offense flounder around a fairly Dickinson type team. He's too good for it. Now you bring in the question, is it Braden Smith coming to the NCAA tournament or is it hobbled Braden Smith? Yeah. Is it 85% Braden Smith? And how much better is 85% Braden Smith the last year? But I do think, like, Fletcher Lawyer's a gamer. Um, it's another one where, like, the things we talked about, like Lance Jones not having a great last couple games. And he's a guy who's, like, been honest. Like, I get a little caught up in things. Like, you can just see it out there. Like, it's not mm-hmm. a secret that he just kind of, like, well, something needs to happen, so I need to make it happen. And Painter kind of reflected yeah. on that last night. Like, don't play hero ball. We don't play with the offense. We, yeah, we don't exist on hero ball. Right. So it's does Grambling have some of the pieces that could make things tough and physical for Purdue? I think so. But also, I don't. If Purdue doesn't turn the ball over a ton, Grambling's not going to score. Right. It, I do and, feel better about Purdue's defense compared to last year. Right. And I think 
Purdue fans now are of the mind that it happened last year. We have to be terrified that it could happen again this year. So we're looking at these teams and we're saying, what do they have in common with FDU? What do they, what do they do well that can give Purdue problems? And at the same time, like, like that's all true. But at the same time, we do need to understand that Purdue is a talented basketball team. Mm-hmm. Purdue ran over most of their schedule to 29 wins. And, you know, they're what it, well, I don't even know what they are in Ken Palm right now, like three or four to somewhere around there. Okay. And as of now, Grambling State is 267th. So this is a team that Purdue should beat. Um, if it is Grambling State, Purdue should beat both of these teams. And we've Purdue fans in general have become scared of their own shadows when it comes to March. And I don't think that has gone on to the players and the coaching staff. I think they're confident and I think they're pissed all about last year. Um, And I hope that that makes it so whoever they play, whether it's Grambling State or whether it's Montana State, that Purdue comes out and just absolutely squashes them as a one seed should. I will tell you 10 minutes into the game whether I think Purdue is going to make the Final Four or not. Okay, Um, good. And here's why. I I think the first five minutes, regardless, Purdue is going to come out to a 10 to 15 point lead over either team. There's no way this team doesn't come out just amped from the start. But do they let off the pedal after that happens? Yeah, yeah. Purdue has a real tendency to do that. And if they don't, I feel very good about them. (laughs) Especially especially don't let off the pedal if Purdue gets Montana State. Okay, yeah. Now, you you promised me good news. The good news is Montana State is not a small team. Okay. They're not a fast, small team like Fairleigh Dickinson. Okay. Do you want more bad news, Ledman? <laughs> no, I don't. They got a bunch of tall dudes that shoot. Shoot a lot. I mean, how tall? How tall? 6'6", six, 6'7", six, 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 A lot of wing guys. A lot of, a lot of okay. wing biggers that... Uh, I, that sounded Wing bad. bigger? Yeah, I don't... Bigger guys. I, I meant there to say bigger guys. Wing uh, and I, bigger guys. I see they shoot 36.7%. From three. Yeah. So they've got forwards that shoot 36 from three, 32% from three, 40% from three. Um, they've just got like a handful of guys that are like six, six to six, eight. And they just chuck it a lot so they can get hot. Yeah. But I would say man, Mont- Mont- Montana, Montana, Montana state. I'm going to have to give you a, a quiz of the 50 state pronunciations here later. Eh, be close. They are not – so they went in the the Big Sky Championship game. They fell down by, like, 11 in the second half, and then in five minutes went on a 23-2 to two run or so. Ooh. So they didn't get hot. Their defense is a little iffy. They're not great on rotations. They've got big guys. Um, a lot of their offense early was just running an alley-oop, and I – I'm assuming there's no one else in the big sky that knows how to dunk because they seem <laughs> really, really flummoxed, baffled by it. Really flummoxed by the ball being thrown up in the air and someone going to grab it. Um, yeah. So there's that, but they are a good team. They execute. They run some good stuff offensively, um, and a lot of shooters around. You have to like, if you're playing a team that can shoot the ball, you've got to be like, if they can shoot from three, they can cut into a lead real quick. So right. you kind of have to stay on top of it from the start. But he's been pretty good at that. I mean, they defend the three-point line really well. So, yeah. So you've you've obviously you've seen these teams. You've watched them a little bit. If you're picking a matchup for Purdue, who would you Purdue rather face? It sounds like you're saying Montana State, but taking a more holistic picture, who would you choose? I think Montana State's a better team. Um, okay. Actually, I don't. I don't know. They played really well in the tournament, but like they're a barely five hundred team. No, I mean they are. If a they are, team. are they five hundred? Yeah, seventeen. Yeah. So like, I think they have the higher ceiling. Um, I think Grambling has the play style on defense that would give Purdue a little more of an issue. Um, I think Montana State's offense is way better. Um. 
they have more big bodies to throw at Edie. Uh, I think they would try to play a slower game. I think Grambling will be sloppy, but try to play a little fast against Purdue. Once again, these are 16 seats. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I think matter. you can, yeah. you can I, tell in just this conversation how seriously we actually are taking it after what happened last year. I mean, we're all big terrified. Tone difference, yeah. We are all terrified. Yeah. So um, I think I would rather see Montana State. Okay. I just don't think you, they have you, the singular bodies that would give Purdue any issue. And defensively, like, they are susceptible to drives and rotations, and I think Purdue's offense. I think it would be more important to see Purdue have a good offensive game to start the tournament. Was, that was going to be my question. Do you think it's going to be better for Purdue to play faster and rely on the guards more in this NCAA tournament? Because as we've seen year after year after year, Guard play is what wins you NCAA right. tournament games, and nobody really is going to have a match for Zach Eady. We know that. We know we can go to him to get his 20 and 12 or whatever, but do we need to allow guys like Braden Smith, like Fletcher Lawyer, Mason Gillis, Lance Jones to take more shots from the perimeter in order to play a style, I guess, that that generally wins in March? Yeah, I think even more than just it it's about getting get going get the offense moving get it running yeah. don't you don't have to get into a half court set every time just like get into your offense get going find your guys you have playmakers everywhere you have smart guys everywhere the quicker your offense moves the harder you're going to make it on the defense and i don't want purdue to push it pull back now let's run a set yeah don't we, let we don't a team like- catch their breath like you talked about uh, a few episodes ago, we don't want to just be getting into our offense when there's, you know, 10 yep. to 12 seconds left on the shot clock. We want to be running. You know, we want to, you find the best shot available still, you run your offense, but you got to get into it. You can't just stand around. Yeah. I, and I think like, I don't see from what I've seen on film of Montana State, I don't think they're going to get in the way of Purdue running stuff. Um, they have more natural size, but like, Size doesn't bother Purdue. Right. Not not when it's just, even if it's skilled size, like, yeah, you can pull ED out a little bit, but, like, Purdue will take that trade off. Mm-hmm. And yeah. especially if it's a team that can't stick with a pick and roll, can't stick with Lance and transition. Um, if Fletcher is able to find space, like, these, these things all work. We know they work. And yeah. I think it's important to Purdue to see that work in the tournament early. I agree. I agree. I think I think that would be a huge confidence boost for the team, for the coaching staff, for the fans. I think they'll all breathe a sigh of relief. But I, I want this to be a traditional one versus sixteen beat down where, you know, you're up by thirty in the second half and you take out some starters for a few minutes to give them a break because you know you're playing again in two days. Yeah, and like Grambling, they won the regular season and they won their tournament. Like you get respect for that. Like Yeah, absolutely. You're good. Like Yeah. And so, um, but I mean, there's positives in both and like Purdue should be able to handle either. It should be a 20 point game regardless, either way. It's just, will it be? And right. Like, right. It's just, there's, there's no good way to talk about it. Cause like, no, it's, it's out of our hands, despite what apparently like some of the assumptions are that when we take something for granted or we feel a certain yeah. way, like we're not, involved. there's, there's nothing, have control. There, there's nothing more annoying to me than when we write something or when we talk about something on the pod and somebody just responds one game at a time. Yeah. I am not playing. Yeah. If, if, if I am playing, we are in trouble. Yeah. I'm trying to get work done ahead of time. Yeah. I okay? got stuff to do. <laughs> I got, I got to look ahead to that eight, nine matchup. Cause I got to figure out who we're covering, who we might play. You know, I'm probably going to go to that game oh, yeah, uh, in Indy because I want to see who is playing Breaking and see how news. they look. Breaking news. Yep. Yeah, it's well, it's going to be a charged weekend in my backyard. Indianapolis, baby. Full crowd. Like, thank God. Thank God Purdue gets Indianapolis. Just f- for the crowd perspective? or There's good vibes. There's good vibes in Indianapolis. Okay, good vibes. There's good right. vibes. Arizona came yeah. here. What happened? We, treated it. We took them. They treated it like Mackey Arena. That's right. Yeah. So I really hope Purdue fans fill up this place. 
for for Friday's game. It's the first one of that session, so it, they'll do the whole you know turn around the arena. But uh, Casey and I have both applied for credentials for our respective sites. Just waiting to hear back. Um, usually, because they don't even close the credentials uh, for a little while now, so we'll probably hear on Tuesday uh, or latest Wednesday. But uh, we'll look forward to that, and maybe Casey and I can record one together in person. We'll have and to one, see. One screen. Yeah, how that works, but uh, never done that before with you, but maybe we will if we're both there. So hopefully it's a joyous episode and we talk about Purdue playing again on Sunday. But Casey, any final thoughts about either of these teams or what Purdue needs to do in round one? I just hope Friday night we are sitting in front of a camera with this monkey off our back. Yes, it yeah. has been I can't imagine what it's, it's been, been like it's been for a the players. Year. I can't imagine what it's been like for Painter. No. Um, I mean, I was talking to these guys about this in summer before they left for Europe. I was talking about it when they got back. We were talking about it throughout the season. We talked about it yesterday when we saw the guys. Just you do you're on the wrong side of history, and then you just gotta like Painter said, you gotta sit in it. But good God, can we get up, please? Yeah. Yeah. Can I, we I, get I'm out of the muck? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I and, need to change the pants. Yeah, the Good. unfortunate thing is, it's always going to follow Purdue and this Purdue team until they do something about it. And their time to do something about it starts Friday at seven twenty-five, I believe, on TBS. Uh, so I think that's right. You know, hopefully Casey and I will be in attendance. You know, maybe we'll see some of you there. Um, but if not, you know, be there to watch it in person or hunker down in front of your TV because we got to get this mon monkey off our back. We got to advance to a uh, round of 32 and then we'll go from there. You know, after that, we got more games to win five more to be specific, but we just got to get through one at a time. Peace. Boiler up. Yeah, My God. It looks dude. awful. Can you even see out of that eye? Yeah. Like without, without, no, I can't. You know, like it's gone line. down today. Jesus, I don't know why it looks it looks real bad from that. You angle. might need to go to the doctor. I know. I don't have any get like some cream or lotion or something. Need yeah. better today. Mm. You might. I bet you can probably just get some like over the counter cream. I have cortisone cream. I just put some on it earlier. Okay. Yeah. God damn. Yeah, we'll see. That's terrifying. Yeah. All, All right. right. I got to go back to work. Get back to work.